sort of redundant. So, so what I'm going to talk to you about is how government views parliament. Um, now, as, uh, as Alan was saying, I'm a former civil servant, and actually one of ministers' big accusations against the civil service is that it doesn't care very much about parliament, doesn't really understand parliament, just sort of assumes it's a bit of the process that, uh, that happens and ministers go off and do their thing there. But actually, one of the things I do want to start off with saying is, next slide, is that What's happening there, James? Is that ministers actually do care about parliament. Why do they care about parliament? Remember what Paul said to you. They are drawn from parliament. They are, sit either as MPs in the Commons or they're members of the House of Lords. This is a survey that the Institute for Government did. Quite difficult to read, but back in um, 2011, it asked ministers and civil servants how they judged who was an effective minister. And what the uh, minister said was the way they performed in Parliament was quite important in their judgment. Civil servants reckoned it didn't matter at all. And why do they care about that? Next slide. They care about that because it makes a difference to their party prospects, their political prospects, their own personal prospects and the prospects of their policy. Uh, this is Lord Norton, Philip Norton, famous academic, saying that uh, that basically uh, performance in Parliament can be key to ministerial survival. Nobody particularly cares whether they're great administrators or not, but if they're seen to be terrible parliamentary performers, it can really dull their career prospects. Not a necessary rule, but it's quite important to bear in mind that. So let's have the next slide. So FAR is taking you through the various ways in which Parliament scrutinises government. So let's have a look at that from the other end. First thing is all those sorts of questions you talked about, oral questions, those sessions planned in advance, written questions. And sometimes it seems in government that some MPs just employ researchers to bombard the department with a million questions. You quite often think, well, actually, couldn't they just have Googled that rather than ask us for all this? a bit lazy um, and urgent questions. So what are they doing there? So that's where they have to go and answer questions about either the policy, the impacts their policies are having, um, but also about the way in which their department is performing. Uh, and those can be some of the most difficult things for ministers to defend when they're having to defend cock-ups by their department. And basically, our rule is that in Parliament, ministers have to take responsibility for things that their departments go wrong. But actually, it's quite useful for ministers because it's also a way of identifying things that are going in wrong. Remember, they sit at the top of these great sprawling bureaucracies. They probably don't know what's going on in some benefit office or an immigration office and things like that. So that can be quite a useful way of them asking questions of their departments. So that can act a bit, a bit two ways and help them see our problems. But you'll notice when you watch question sessions that sometimes people stand up and ask questions that aren't really questions at all. They're really just openings for ministers to score political points for their own side. And those are what we call planted questions. And you will probably be quite shocked to know that quite a bit of effort goes in to making sure that there are at least in any session, at least some helpful questions that allow ministers to get their points out about how well they're doing on uh, various things or how much they care about a certain region. So it's not just that. So this is a highly political event. Prime Minister's questions are the most political of those. The more testing thing, and actually in some ways, the more annoying thing from a government point of view are urgent questions. Those are questions that are about something that is happening that day. That can completely scramble your day's diary. Suddenly the minister's meetings all have to be scrapped. Civil servants are running around and people are working out what on earth is going on and more importantly, what on earth do we say about it? Uh, but those are really quite useful at allowing Parliament to get government to answer straight away about what are you doing about this thing? Uh, what is going wrong there? So next slide. But those are quite knockabout sessions. The more forensic experience is when a minister is required to come to 
give evidence to a select committee. That might be preceded by their officials. Officials, though, can't say, well, actually, we never advised that minister to do that. Uh, it was his stupid idea. They have to defend government policy because the civil service works for the government of the day. This is Matt Hancock, former health secretary, giving evidence to one of the many select committee hearings that we had on COVID. Um, there you can have more detailed questions. MPs can ask follow-up questions, say, well, I don't think you really answered my question this time. They don't do that in, uh, in Parliament, in the, on the floor of the chamber, nearly so much. But actually, quite often, they're not very good investigators, uh, not trained barristers, by and large. They don't ask very forensic questions. And so what often you will find is the minister reckons that if you can uh, keep blustering through one person's uh, set of answers, then their time comes up because questions are shared around between MPs and you can move on pretty much unscathed. Those grillings end up with reports uh, by select committees, which are quite often quite critical of the government. But you'll find then that actually government produces replies that look a bit like a brush off, even though there may be a majority of government MPs on that committee, they might say, well, actually, you know, we're not going to do that. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily mean they have no impact, but you might be surprised at how dismissive the answers are and quite often how difficult select committees find it to get ministers to give straight answers and to get information out of government. Next. And as um, we were saying earlier, as far as I was saying earlier, Ministers often like to bypass Parliament to get announcements out. Why do you want to do that? Because if you get an announcement out early, when you've just put out a press release, you can avoid a lot of difficult questions about the detail, but you can also dominate the headlines. So this is the scene of lots and lots of arguments between ministers and Parliament. And the Speaker, Lindsay Hoyle, has been complaining that ministers are failing to treat Parliament with proper respect by preferring to give either those Downing Street press conferences or get the news out to the morning media before they bother to make an announcement in Parliament. He keeps on saying he will do things about it, but in truth, there's actually not that much he can do. Uh, you might want to think about whether there's more that he could do to insist that Parliament is informed first. Next. So that was all about Parliament uh, in its scrutiny role, uh, ministers announcing things to Parliament. Some of those announcements, though, turn into legislation. Uh, Farah took you through all the stages of legislation, uh, but as Paul said, our governments are based on the majority party, so government usually assumes it can get its legislation through. But it will face, and you'll see if you ever looked at the progress of any piece of parliamentary legislation, a bit of a niche activity, you have to say, that MPs put down lots of amendments at those various stages that, uh, that Farah was talking you through. And the government then decides it needs to decide what to do. And it's basically got three options, one of which is to resist the amendment, to try and get it voted down, to use its majority, say, no, nope, we're not going to do that. The other one is just to say, oh, yeah, good idea. Uh, we hadn't thought of that. That would improve the bill. We'll accept the amendment. Or sometimes they say, well, it's a good idea in principle, but actually you're not as good at parliamentary drafting, writing bills as we are. So we'll propose an alternative. Most amendments from the opposition will be resisted. Uh, partly because they're trying to say, actually, the government's not very good, it's missing the point, it's a bit rubbish, and this is how we would do it better. But you will see exceptions there, and there's some particularly problematic things when there's not a government majority to resist. Then ministers have to decide what they do. We've seen quite a lot of that. But in extreme cases, Parliament can actually force ministers to abandon proposals. We've seen that on some tax proposals. This was the example of the NHS reforms in the early 2010s when the bill was paused in Parliament because there was so much opposition to it. Next. And that's why sometimes ministers prefer secondary legislation. This is the sort of legislation which goes through a much simplified process. Parliament might not even get a vote on it. Parliament certainly can't amend it. So you will see ministers tempted to say, well, actually, I don't want to go through the full business of taking my legislation through the House. Uh, it can get amended. It can tie us up for ages. It's too tacky. We don't want to waste Parliament's time. That's actually quite a good reason for doing secondary legislation. Or we need to do things in a rush. Um, but that can mean that quite a lot of 
bad legislation gets onto the statute book and legislation that's not very well understood. And actually, you quite often see government doesn't even really understand its own legislation. And there's a big gap between what the government's actually put into law through regulations and the guidance that it issues. We saw quite a lot of that on some of the COVID legislation over the last year. Next. But what I've been talking about are all the ways in which Parliament influences government you know, directly and how government reacts. But what you've got to remember is ministers are political creatures. They're part of a party. They're part, if you like, of a tribe. And there's an awful lot of activity that goes on behind the scenes. That's probably where parliamentary influence is even bigger. Uh, that's where either they're forced through questions to say to their department, actually, I think we're on pretty shaky ground here. We need to look again at this. They actually think the Select Committee made quite a good point that they found it very difficult to defend uh, and they want the department to get a grip. Or individual MPs, buttonhole ministers during a vote. Remember, they all vote in there together. That's one reason why they didn't like, people didn't like that virtual voting. Or they get letters in raising concerns. And that behind-the-scenes activity... Uh, can be much more powerful than the stuff you see uh, going on in front of the TV cameras. And ultimately, that can actually constrain what the government does, uh, can force policy rethinks, but it can also mean the ministers can say, well, actually, we think this is a good idea, but we just won't get it through Parliament, so we're actually not even going to propose it. So you might like to think about whether it would be better that a bit more of that is done in front of uh, the cameras for all of us rather than behind the scenes or indeed is that even possible to do that's all from me so good luck with thinking about all of that